without almost much further ado. Thank you so much. No. Um, Tom Moore, I just met uh, like an hour ago. Well, we've had a wonderful time uh, getting to know one another and uh, learned Tom did his undergrad at Harvard in music, got, uh, and so there you got interested in, in uh, so-called early music. Went on to get a master's in DMA at, at Stanford in the days when Stanford had a performance. Stanford doesn't have much performance thing these days. In those days, long, long ago. Before uh, the Performance Institute at Indiana. In early um, where when performance and scholarship were very uh, tightly interwoven. I don't know what the hell. When, uh, you know, when you used to have to do both these things. Uh, Tom was part of that, got his DMA at Stanford, and became a music librarian, been a visiting professor at uh, University of Rio de Janeiro, and now you are the head of sound and image at FIU. So I'm going to stop rambling. Please welcome Tom Moore. It says here, Shalom, y'all. Salam, peace. I'm so glad to be here, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so um, we're going to talk about a totally unknown area of, of music history. and even talk a little bit about music historiography. Um, your professor and myself are old enough that we've seen a couple of generations of music history and musicology go by, and uh, I did my undergraduate work at Harvard in the 70s when Susan McClary was a grad student there, so I remember her when she was like, um, before she was Susan McClary almost, when she was studying Italian madrigals. So, um, in the 70s, uh, the Renaissance musicologists were king. People like Lehman Perkins and Louise Litterick and, and so forth. And so, since then, we've seen a, a huge move towards more critical thinking, more literary theory, away from sort of positivistic uh, investigation about details of careers, and manuscript studies and producing editions of music. Those are all things that were uh, huge areas of prestige in 1970, 75, back when Musica Disciplina was the place to publish. That's not true anymore. Uh, so now we get to look at the literary, the social backgrounds, the socioeconomic reasons for our music to exist, and I'll talk a little about that too. But um, what I'm going to be pointing out is is that the information I'll be presenting has not really been a matter of interest in the last generation or two because we're not interested in finding about who published what when and why and with whom and how much it cost so uh, when I talk to flute professors flute uh, where's our flutists here so your flute professor probably is not going to talk about music history very much. Um, your flute professor, he or she will talk about a specific piece, a specific repertoire, um, very much focused on usually uh, the, the repertoire that deals with the period of Tafanel and Goubert. You all have a copy of Tafanel and Goubert, right? Yes, okay. And you probably have played the Chaminade Concertino. <laughs> yes, right? Am I right? So, but I'm willing to bet you have never heard of any of the 50 composers I'm going to be talking about today, and there's a reason for that. Uh, so, why am I giving this lecture? Uh, as I said, I've been old enough to remember this stuff since the 1970s, and the revival of period instruments uh, in general, harpsichord, baroque violin, and uh, the, the baroque flute, in particular got started in the 1970s, really. Uh, some of it goes back earlier than that. Uh, so in 
the late 70s, you could hear the famous Franz Bergen, who was a recorderist primarily, but also started out as a flutist, who sometimes would play on a Baroque flute, a one-key flute, uh, which is the ancestor of our modern concert flute, uh, the French-style silver flute. Uh, so it was in the late 70s we started to have recordings. Stephen Preston did some wonderful early recordings. And until 1980, it was very difficult to get access to this music. If you went to a music library, there would not be a modern published edition of this music. Uh, and there wasn't even access to facsimiles of this music. They started to be published around 1980. Uh, this space, uh, which is based in, in Italy, got started in 1979. They're now going out of business. Uh, performance facsimiles, um, which is an American um, enterprise, has a huge series of about 300 different facsimiles. They got started in 85. And our flute professors, and I can say this about flute professors because they're my nearest and dearest friends, uh, they are generally unaware of this repertoire I'm going to be talking about. <clears throat> they generally have this notion that there was wonderful flute music at the time of Bach. Everybody plays the Bach Partita. Everybody plays the Bach B minor sonata. We played the Telemann sonatas, of which there's dozens. We now play Bois Mortier. But the idea is, in the 19th century, there's no flute repertoire. Not just a little flute repertoire. There's no flute repertoire. Uh, and so we think of our major list of canonic composers from the early uh, 19th century. Uh, and Almost all of them wrote nothing for flute. Um, there's one, two sets of works for flute and piano by Beethoven, which are dreadful. Uh, 100, uh, Opus 107, anybody know those? There's a reason you don't know those. Okay. Uh, the Schubert variations on Park the Blumen that you have played, those are an exception. So we have this notion that if there is any music from this period, it's stupid, empty display not worth serious interest by musicologists. The reality of the situation is completely the opposite. Uh, this period is the richest period of music for the flute, and it makes sense because this was precisely the period in which the flute went from this instrument through this instrument to the burn flute that we all know and play today. I didn't bring one of those because you have, I'm sure, one of those at home. Uh, so they're challenging for the burn flute and they're challenging for the eight key flute. Uh, the repertoire is immense. It includes very demanding works for unaccompanied flute. So how many people have heard the, the Bach Partita in performance? You've all heard it in performance, right? You probably heard it many times in performance. So there are lots of other works besides this one work by Bach. Bless his heart. Uh, there's a huge repertoire of music for flute quartet. We all play the, uh, the, the Mozart flute quartets, right? You can hum the tune, I'm sure, right? I don't even have to give you a pitch, right? But there's dozens, hundreds of other pieces in that genre. Why is there this disconnect between the reality of the situation and our concept of the situation? Musicologists are rarely flutists. Who can name a flutist who is a musicologist who is a flutist? Anybody? I'll have to think about it. <laughs> Neil Zaslaw is a flutist, uh, and there's a couple of others. Myself, <laughs> uh, but I don't know whether you've all gone through the Tereskin history. Big book, right? Thousands and thousands of words. He mentions not a single flutist. If you go and uh, do the uh, keyword search, you won't find anything. The one thing that you do find is Vladimir Usachevsky, <laughs> who's a composer. Uh, so flutists, as I said before, are rarely musicologists. We have this tendency to focus on a, a very specific modern repertoire for the modern French flute because we think that is the pinnacle of the creation for flute. There's no published editions of the repertoire I'm going to be talking about. Because the musicologists don't know about it, the music librarians don't know about it either. You know, where do we get our information as music librarians? 
the music that survives from this period is almost all, always transmitted in bound volumes. Uh, and this is true of, all, of a lot of music. Uh, piano music is, is this way too. If you were a pianist in the 19th century and you went out and bought published music, it would not be in a binding. It would come as a soft cover thing and then you would collect a couple dozen and put them in a, a leather binding that you paid somebody to, to make and then it would sit on your shelf and it would be preserved forever. Uh, so, when one of these bound volumes of flute music comes into a library, music librarians are lazy. They don't want to have to deal with cataloging this thing, which may have 20 or 30 different bibliographic items in them. Even the largest and most prestigious and richest <coughs> libraries that have this material don't spend the money to catalog it. Harvard, for example. Oberlin, FSU. So, uh, two seconds about the, the instruments. The instrument that Bach would have been using is something like this. Four sections in wood, has one key to play the E flat. Everything else is a chromatic scale achieved with cross fingering. Uh, so this particular instrument is based after an instrument circa 1790 by Grenzer. So people continued to play one key flutes until the late 19th century. Uh, then, in the uh, 19th century, the late 18th century, they started to put keys to fix the problematical notes. So, um, the problematical notes on this instrument are F, because it's a fork fingering, uh, G uh, sharp, because it's a fork fingering, A sharp, because it's a fork fingering, so they added the F key, the G sharp key, and the A sharp key. For specifically those three notes, it was just fixing those three notes. So essentially, this instrument continues to be very similar to what we call a traverso. It's just that it has keys to fix those particular notes. Uh, this instrument now has an additional key to fix the C. Uh, the C is cross-fingered also in that the first octave, so you want to fix that. Uh, th there's also, it's awkward to play the F uh, in certain situations, uh, and so you have to have a supplementary F, a long F on the side. Otherwise, this is just like, exactly like the four key flute. One of the things that you can see is different between this flute and this flute is this has a tuning joint. Ni 18th century flutes had multiple uh, second joints here so that you could play at different pitch levels because pitches were not standardized. And this allows you to get by without having multiple second joints, this tuning slide. This continues to be part of the uh, technology of the flute. This instrument is from Philadelphia circa 1815 and you can see it, it has only one key but it already has a tuning slide. It's already more modern than this instrument. And then finally, uh, particularly in England and in Germany, they added uh, the C foot. These flutes all play down to only D. This has a C foot, so you have to have a longer barrel, and you have open standing keys, which you close with these uh, extensions. So this is the, the modern technology of the flute, called an eight key flute. When Burham went to England, he heard a notable English flutist, Nicholson, playing on an instrument like this, uh, which had very large holes because the larger the holes are, the larger sound you have, and this is before you have amplification, right? So he went back, and being a good German technician, he said, how can I make the holes on my instrument even larger? So, also being a good German technician, he invented a very elaborate system of keys, which you're familiar with. So the, instead of having these little tiny holes, you have very big, 
holes. So it makes it louder and also evens out the sound and the tuning. But this eight key flute was continued to be manufactured until the 1920s at least. So um, I've given you a list of 50 unknown flutists. Uh, just to give you an idea of the size of the neglected repertoire that we're talking about. And I said li I listed only 50 because I have personally looked at music from each of these composers with the exception of one or two. I have scores for these composers all in my hard drive. Uh, does anybody recognize anybody, any of these names? Can you read them? Yes? Yes, Barry Gay. Anybody else? Furstenau. Furstenau, exactly. He wrote a method. Anybody else? Drouet. Anybody heard Drouet? We still play the Drouet exercises. Here's the, the next 20. And again, <laughs> out of those 20, you probably know one or two names. Uh, Yes, there are, we, we can get modern editions of Perler. Uh, there's some modern editions of Kummer. Uh, there's a few modern editions of Keller. And that's about it. Remouza, anybody here of Remouza? He owned the gold flute that Jean-Pierre Rompal used to play. Uh, Zussmann, Tulu. You may know Wunderlich from the Hugo and Wunderlich method. So, out of that 55, maybe 10%, right, that we have even heard of, if let alone play. So, how do you find out about this music? Um, luckily, the Germans were very good systematic bibliographers. There is a wonderful uh, Handbuch of uh, basically the entire published musical repertoire. Uh, by Whistling, uh, first edition 1817, uh, second edition 1828, third edition in the 1840s. After that, it was just supplements. <coughs> it's systematically organized with the most important things first, uh, which is still the way the Library of Congress classification system works, right? Generalities come first, then religion. Religion is the most important thing, of course. Uh, so. Music for orchestra, then music for wind ensemble, harmony, that's what that is. Violin, viola, cello, and contrabass, the, the members of the orchestra. And then the next thing that comes up is flute. Flute is the most important thing after the orchestral instruments. And more important than clarinet, bass, and horn, oboe, bassoon, serpent, flagellate, chacon, <laughs> French horn, ophicline. Guitar. So within each of these categories, it's subdivided. So F is for flute, FA is large ensembles, and then it goes from there. Septets, sextets, quintets, quartets, trios, duos. Uh, there's nine complete pages in the bibliography of duos, but there's even more nine and a half pages for unaccompanied flute. These are not methods. These are not exercises. These are concert pieces for the flute, the unaccompanied flute. So in addition to your Bach uh, partita and your Telemann fantasies, there are literally thousands of pieces for unaccompanied flute that you could play if you only knew they existed. Uh, so in comparison to the other Material. Of course, there's 320 pages for piano. But look, for violin, 37 pages, viola, two pages. <laughs> Clarinet, five pages, but 38 pages of music for guitar. We don't have any concept of how important the guitar was. Why was the flute so important? Why was the guitar so important? because these were inexpensive instruments that the middle class could buy without breaking their bank. People who had pianos had wealth. People who had flutes and guitar were members of the middle class that could afford to make music at home, and that's why we have this immense flute and guitar repertoire.
but solo violin. There's only three pages. Why? The violinists were busy playing concert, concert parts. They weren't playing for their own entertainment. They were playing to get paid. The flutists, the performing flutists, would write the music, and then it would be purchased by the middle class people who wanted to play the, the music. So, this handbook, because it's a German publication, only covers German publishers. So, these are the places that they cover. Prague, of course, is part of the, um, the empire still. Uh, Milan is part of the empire still. Copenhagen is within the German cultural sphere. So, what does that mean? It means that we don't have any publications from France. Paris, most of Italy, uh, London, uh, and so in spite of the fact that this is an immense tome, there's a huge area of publications it doesn't cover. Why don't we have a, a bibliography for these other countries? Because they weren't German. <laughs> you know, they didn't have systematic cataloging of this material. So, in the handbook, which as you remember, only covers this Germanic universe and the things that are published in the Germanic universe, there are almost 600 individual names of composers. 70 of these are arrangements of pieces by third parties, but that leaves more than 500 that are writing original works intended for the flute, not arrangements. <laughs> We're not talking about arrangements of Beethoven violin sonatas for flute. No, these are original compositions. And again, how many of these names do you know? This is just the B's. Berbigier is there. Leo, Leopoldine Blahetka. Boxa, he's the famous harpist. There's Bricialdi. We've played some Bricialdi. But that's just the bees. I wasn't going to show you all 500. <laughs> so, Schwedler, anybody heard of Schwedler? He designed a, a modern version of this eight key flute with additional keys, but it still wasn't the Berm flute. It was his own uh, adaptation of the, uh, the earlier simple system flute. But, nevertheless, somebody who was not a professor of the Berm flute was the flute professor at the Leipzig Conservatory from 1908 to 1932. At the point when the French were playing their French flutes made of silver and Tafanal Gobert and Louis Moise, Marcel Moise, uh, he was playing a wooden heavy German simple system flute in Leipzig. Uh, so, he wrote a book called Catechism of the Flute, What You Need to Know to Be a Flutist. Went through three editions, so this gives us a window into what they were playing in Leipzig. So, the Anderson Etudes, uh, Drouet, Fürstenau, Perler, Homer, Prill, these now we're in um, the concert music. So there's Kulau, Fürstenau, Drouet, Berbigier, a few of the composers that were present in this period, 1800 <coughs> to 1850, just a few. Uh, a tiny amount of this music is available commercially. I found a dozen pieces in Spotify that you can go listen to. I'll send you the links later if you're interested. So, just so that you have a sense of what this music is, what it looks like. I'll go through a few of these composers, uh, and before our eyes glaze over, I'll stop and we'll take questions. <laughs> um, this is from a manuscript source uh, at FSU in the Hitchcock Collection. They have this collection of 75 bound volumes, which came to them in a, in a, a chest like this. Uh, it has not been fully cataloged yet. Nancy Schneelock Bingham, professor at the Appalachian State uh, in Boone, uh, did a catalog of it for her dissertation, but that's the only way you're going to find out what they have, <laughs> unless you go there and actually look in, in the volumes. The collector uh, not only purchased all these printed editions, but he also wrote everything out for the things he couldn't get 
purchased editions for. So he would have borrowed a, co a purchased edition, give it back to the person that he got it from after copying it into his manuscript volumes. And there's six large manuscript volumes, and they're pretty much leg legible if you print them out. So Andrew Ash, we've never heard of anything by Andrew Ash, but here's a wonderfully elaborate ornamented piece based on Ye Banks and Braes, a Scottish tune. Uh, and you can see it's um, pretty elaborate. Belke, uh, he was a, a German composer. His brother was a trombonist. He didn't write very much flute music, but what he did was very difficult and very rewarding. You can see the level of blackness <laughs> over here. How would you like to play that for your, um, your recital? would be um, not a piece of cake. Uh, this same volume, this is the second set of caprices. The first set has been published in the modern edition. There's no, uh, there's not even a PDF of this available on the internet. I got it from a friend who photographed it for me. The final piece in this uh, edition is an arrangement for solo unaccompanied flute of the Bach Chromatic Fantasy and Fugue. Imagine playing that on your solo. There's a, a recording on YouTube of it, on a period flute. Becquier, he was part of the first, uh, maybe second uh, set of students to go through the conservatory, died very young at 25, but he left a few pieces. This is from the collection at Oberlin. Berbequier, uh, he was the first generation of students to go through the Conservatoire in Paris. He published his Opus I uh, in Paris while he was still a student at the Conservatoire. Very difficult um, music that's sort of a combination of technical study and concert piece. Uh, <coughs> this is a very late edition of a uh, set of variations. There's 12 different sets, Opus 106. Uh, so, you can imagine that there's quite a lot of music by Verbiguet that's waiting to be discovered, including seven sets of sonatas, uh, unaccompanied, uh, excuse me, uh, sonatas that have sort of ad libitum accompaniment uh, for bass or violin, uh, viola. Behrens, uh, another very important composer, Conrad Behrens, uh, he's writing operatic fantasies, so this is a potpourri. Um, musicologists don't like things that have to do with opera because opera is not really serious enough. It's not quite German enough. And especially everybody thinks that potpourris are just futile display. But we, we accept it when it's Liszt, but not when it's flute, right? So there's some wonderful sets of, uh, of music on operas by Behrens, and they almost always include sets of variations on the popular tune from the particular opera. Camus, uh, he was one of the early adopters of the berm flute, so if you want to play this music on your berm, fl berm flute and feel uh, historically justified, you can do it. Uh, this, has, again, is a set of uh, ornamentations, elaborations on uh, Massaniello by Aubert. So not only we don't know the flute music, we don't really know the operas it's based on, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, Cortinese. Another uh, French composer who was active in England as well. And this is a set of six fantasies uh, on uh, the Postillon de Longjumeau by Adolphe Adam, uh, Opus 48, and two sets. So if you think this is Opus 48, and this has six individual pieces, which are probably 10 minutes each. Do the math. There's at least 300 solo pieces by this composer that you don't know yet. Dressler. Uh, he's a German composer, also active in England. Uh, this was published in uh, Bonn by Simrock, but the original edition was published in England, where he was active. So the University of Toronto has the whole set. This is part one uh, of the set. Uh, and it's all been digitized and it's available on their website. Uh, so it's usually uh, 
arrangements of um, sets of variations of popular tunes. This is a German tune, and um, it's very effectively written for the flute. Really nice music. There's a set of uh, six uh, variations which are even more difficult than this. Uh, Drew Way. Uh, he was probably the most famous virtuoso of the fruit, flute in the early 19th century. Uh, was originally from the Low Countries. This is his very first collection of, of music to be published. This happens to be um, photocopied or scanned from the uh, collection of the Hitchcock collection at FSU. Uh, and it's very high in the register for the flute. So if you're playing a modern flute, it takes a lot of support to be able to play in the third octave all the time. But if I'm playing on one of these flutes, which has a narrow bore, uh, it's really the, the high notes just pop out. Uh, and it's not particularly chromatic. There's a lot of elaboration, but there's not so much chromaticism. So it's very easy to play it on a simple flute like this uh, in terms of the technical demands. Uh, he had a very long career. He arrived in New York, uh, published a, a set of exercises for the Burm flute about 1850, and also a set of uh, operatic arrangements uh, published for flute and piano or harp. So if you have a harpist you're working with, there's a wonderful set of those. Uh, and very elaborately ornamented, you know, the sort of ornamentation that the operatic uh, performers would have been doing at the time. Just to give you an idea of how deep this repertoire is, this composer, I couldn't get my hands on a score. He is a French composer, so of course he only has one work listed in Whistling. Remember, Whistling, the handbook is covering German publications. Because he's French, he only had this one piece published in Germany at the time. But I went to look at the online catalog for the Bibliothèque Nationale, and there's all these pieces that he published in Paris, none of which have been digitized yet. Presumably, they're still in the library in Paris until it gets burned down. Uh, and uh, I really hope that they digitize them soon. So even if we can't get our hands on this music, we can still know it's out there. Philip Ernst, he was from Mainz, which is where Schott Publications got its start. Uh, he published uh, a set of 20 operatic pieces for flute and guitar. This is one of them. He was a, a flutist and a guitarist, so he wrote an idiomatic part for both. He also wrote a set of uh, eight uh, sets of variations on uh, the most popular tunes from uh, Freischutz, which came out the year that Freischutz was premiered. Then he moved to the United States in about 1840, never published anything more. He had, it was too far from New York to, to Mainz in those days. So in spite of the fact he wrote wonderful flute music, and he came and had a very successful career in Manhattan as a flute teacher. We know where his studio was, where his home was. He was the person that brought Drouet to Manhattan to come and play. But his published legacy ends in Mainz. Here's to now. So, look at this. Would you like to play that on your burn flute? Now think about playing it on this instrument where the home key is D major. This is an E flat. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> so, if we think about this repertoire, some of it is very highly technically challenging, and in my view, it's also musically rewarding. Etienne Gebauer was the member of a, a family woodwind quartet. The other three brothers played uh, clarinet, horn, and bassoon. Uh, and they all published music for their instruments. He published a lot of these sets of variations. 
they're challenging, but not on the level of the fierce to know. But they're wonderful music. And I'm not going to go through <laughs> the other 50 composers, but take it from me that they're on this level of, of rewardingness for the flutists. They're all grateful to play. They would be wonderful concert pieces. I've been focusing mostly on unaccompanied music, but there's a huge repertoire for flute and piano, for two flutes, for flute and string quart, uh, string trio, for flute and string quartet. There's plenty of flute concertos that we have never heard yet, including I think there's about ten by Bear Bigier. Uh, so I'm just trying to overwhelm you with the depth of the, the music that you haven't had a chance to get to know. And thank God, it's still in the libraries. Uh, and it's still even available um, from private uh, sources. So if you go to eBay or a, a, a website that will have period scores available, you can buy these things for 20 30 40 50 dollars And it's almost guaranteed that you will find an item that has not been cataloged by any library in the world. At most, it might be in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Uh, <clears throat> one final story. On eBay, uh, I saw somebody who was advertising four pounds of music. <laughs> <laughs> she was a craft person from Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, where the Amish live. Mm -hmm. And she said, buy this music, play it, or cut it up for crafts. <laughs> <laughs> and, it had some photos of what the music was, and I could see that it was music for flute and piano. And it was $30, which is not so bad. So I ordered the box, and it arrived. And it had 12 individual pieces, at least eight of which did not exist in any library. And uh, including among these were four or five pieces for flute and piano, concert fantasies on popular tunes like Robin Adair, the sort of thing that Nicholson would have played, by J.S. Cox, who was a notable flutist in Philadelphia. This music was published by J.W. Pepper, which still exists today. Uh, and I couldn't find another copy of this material everywhere, anywhere, so I have the only surviving copy. What happened next? This person put another box online. And this is when I had very little money, and I thought, my mother will kill me if I spend another $30 on flute, you know, if I tell her that I did it. Uh, but if I don't buy this box, I know that people are going to cut it up <laughs> for, for crafts. And the crafts will get in their, their children's rooms or whatever, and then it'll get thrown away, and that's it. So if I don't buy this box, I am condemning this American music, because it was all American music, to the inferno. So I bought the box, <laughs> and I got another dozen concert pieces for flute and piano uh, by American composers that are not anywhere else, and they're all digitized on the FIU site, and you can go and download them, print them, play them with your flute professors. So it's a huge area for research, uh, and uh, I encourage you as flutists or as musicologists, there's a huge amount of work to be done. Uh, the 19th century is neglected, uh, and for a ver various reasons, and particularly instrumental music is neglected. Uh, so I just tried to give you a little window into a little tiny area that um, I think needs to be better known. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? that we know a lot of from this era is uh, Kulau, Didi Kulau. We play a lot of his music. So I was wondering, how do you explain that his music is so readily available to all of us now, and not so much you know, the other of, of his contemporaries? It's a good question. He wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a flutist. Right. He, he was, was a pianist. Was a, and uh, I think, Number one, it's in the Germanic 
cultural sphere, uh, and German music has been privileged by German musicology, and American musicology has its roots in, in German musicology, and it has to be admitted that the Germans are the best at doing musicology in terms of systematic research. Um, the French have not done the sort of work that the Germans have done in terms of looking at their history. Uh, so why is, why is Bear Begay unknown in Kulau? Everybody plays the Kulau duos and, and solos and so forth. I think that's why. I know you were talking about um, putting uh, pieces up online, but uh, did you do any research to see how many um, of these composers were listed on IMSLP? Because I know they're starting to get a lot more obscure. Yes, um, IMSLP usually is, is presenting stuff that has been digitized elsewhere. Okay. Um, so for example, uh, the National Library in Denmark has a strong digitization program. Um, the National Library in Paris took a while to get started, but they now have a strong program. Uh, the Bavarian State Library in Munich has a very strong digitization program. So the stuff that gets to IMSLP is usually not stuff that people personally own, but that they've taken from one of these websites and then put into the IMSLP website. Um, the stuff that I put up at, at uh, FIU is either stuff that's in my personal collection or in the collection of FIU. Uh, and uh, somebody could take it uh, legally and put it on IMSLP, but since I already have made it available at a high level of resolution on our server, I don't feel I, I have to go and put it on IMSLP, especially now IMSLP is asking for people to pay to use it, uh, which is a recent development. So, yeah. Um, it's very difficult to find this material because if you go to one of our bibliographical sources like WorldCat, it's hard to limit your search down to this particular kind of stuff. So, and even if it's out there, it may not have been cataloged in WorldCat yet either. So <coughs> there's, there's a variety of reasons this stuff is very hard to get at. Have you checked out any uh, the, of the stylistic differences, the, the Germanic, uh, the German thing versus the French thing, is one more virtuosic or uh, of an internationalist style at that I would say the Germanic material could almost be more technically demanding. There's a, a wonderful set of uh, pieces for unaccompanied uh, flute which was published in Denmark by Milde in about 1825, which includes Kulau, Peterson, uh, uh, Niels Peter Jensen that I didn't, didn't mention. He's a very important flute composer from Denmark. Um, similar to Kulau uh, and equally difficult. Uh, so I would say perhaps that's one distinction. Um, not to say that the French repertoire is not challenging, because it is, but you know, the French always have this sort of charm in addition to the, the technical challenge. Uh, so, in terms of the English repertoire, the English repertoire tends to be written um, for a slightly lower tessitura. So I think the English like to have a big, fat sound on their flutes. If, you, if you've heard Irish flute playing, that's the sort of big, beefy sound that the the English would have been going for, so that they didn't want to spend their time up in the third octave with these little thin sounds. They wanted to have a really loud sound. Uh, and that being said, the English also had a very strong focus on Celtic music. Um, Nicholson has tons of pieces uh, on Celtic tunes, and not just Nicholson, but th they all have this focus on the um, Irish and Scottish music particularly from this period. We, we don't really realize how prevalent that idiom was in, in, in Europe at, at the time, but for example, there's an opera that was famous at the time called La Dame Blanche, 
um, by Wild Dieu. And it's full of Celtic tunes. You know, it just, it, it couldn't be any more full of Celtic tunes. And it's set in Scotland, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so there was a vogue for this stuff. You know, just like we, we love it today. Who doesn't love Altan and, and all the people who play these, these Celtic uh, tunes? But uh, that was a period at, when it was at its height. Quick one. I'm fascinated by your music for crafts story. I wonder if that woman you were able to find out where she got the boxes of music, and I'm wondering if she just stopped at two boxes, or there was more online after that. I wish I knew. <laughs> you know, it's these days you can find all sorts of things online that you would never have gotten your hands on before. I used to hunt early uh, antique shops, and you would never find these instruments. Uh, and now you can find them because it connects the, the seller with the buyer. Uh, but I, it was it was just a s total just storm of luck yeah. Yeah. Uh, to find those things, uh, especially you know given that American music is disrespected, you know, and American flute music is disrespected. To have this stuff just appear out of the blue, yeah. uh, I haven't recorded it yet. But a friend of mine. In, Massachusetts did a concert like a month later with music from this collection as soon as I put it online. <laughs> because people want to give the respect due to our American music and it's hard uh, because our musicology profession has been looking at Wagner when it could have been looking at J.S. Cox. Uh, so yeah, who knows what you could find out there. Uh, well, we, we always think that this material is gone for good, but then something like the Telemann vial fancies that were gone for 300 years are back. Uh, they were in a private collection. <laughs> How could they be in a private collection <laughs> until last year? But they were. So, more questions, yes? I'm, I'm really interested in all this, in the, how, you know, in your laying out of how the technology has changed over time. And I'm kind of curious how um, the technology the basically compositional changes were impact, basically composers were responding to or impacting, how, how technology and composition were intertwined, basically. And also, I'm wondering, um, you, know, you said that a lot of flout, flautists, people, people who were buying this music, were um, amateurs or, or just that flout flute was, so um, did, that, did, all, that, did that also play into this discourse of technology and composition? Sure. So, um, the piano went from being a high luxury item in, say, 1810 to being a mass consumer good by 1860 or so. Uh, and so, people who could never have afforded at their grandparents' generation. It became absolutely necessary for a bourgeois house to have a piano by the later um, 19th century. We think of uh, Jane Austen, right? Jane Austen was at a fairly high social level. She was in a household that was wealthy enough to have a piano. Uh, she could play concertos on her piano. but. The rest of, you know, she was in the 1%, right? She wasn't in the 99%. But by the later 19th century, you get to the point where you, anybody can have a piano. Um, I've done a lot of research on uh, Brazilian music. And there's a, uh, a set of, of sort of caricatures from the late 19th century published in one of the magazines down there, which talks about, about five different neighborhoods. and the social class and the music that's associated with the social class. So the, the sort of lowest part of the bourgeoisie has a guitar and the people are singing with the guitar. Then the next level up has a piano and then the next, you know, goes on from there. But, you know, the middle class already has the piano. Uh, and the same would have been true you know, pretty much any place in the developed world in the late 19th century. 
the flute um, was present in Brazil as something that anybody could own and anybody could play. So you would have tra traveling ensembles of musicians which would play a, a flute. They would arrange pieces that were arranged originally for piano, shotishes and waltzes and mazurkas and so forth, and it would be accompanied by guitar. Um, but at the same time that this got started, the, uh, the cost of a piano was just insanely prohibitive. It would have been the same as a healthy slave when they were selling slaves in Brazil. It was a huge amount of money. Uh, so that's where I would go from having amateur flutists to having amateur pianists. Uh, and also this, the gender distribution went from having men who played the flute. If we think of Friedrich the Great, he played the flute. It was normal for gentlemen to play the flute, but by the late 19th century, men were not playing amateur music anymore. It was the women of the household who were playing piano. So it's, we, it's all connected with the socioeconomics of the society in question. I, I see that I'm close to time up. Yeah. Yes. Any last questions? Say flute, uh, last minute flute stuff? And you can ask me over lunch. There you go. <laughs> Well, Tom, thank you very, very much. This is great. Thank you. While you're tearing down, you might have the flutist uh, look over the instruments. Oh, absolutely, yes.